Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today we'll commission a basic PLC system. Our objective is to establish a base state to demonstrate applications of the Tico SG210HRA PLR, an inexpensive basic programmable logic controller, or PLC. Once installed and tested, we'll use this system to demonstrate various PLC programs without the time-consuming necessity of ever having to physically rewire field input or output devices. PLCs, among their many virtues, are reprogrammable devices, and this system is intended to provide us an ample playground with minimal effort beyond this initial installation and test. This lecture is predicated on the assumption that viewers watch the PLC Interface Methods lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet, or only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. Additionally, it is presumed the viewer has some experience with applications the motor control trainer kit and board up to and including reversing motor starters with interlocks. Finally, it is presumed the viewer has some experience with a Tico SG2 PLR. We'll initiate this application exercise with primary devices configured in the following fashion. A main circuit breaker makes and breaks connection to light industrial 120 volt line to neutral, 208 volt line to line, 60 hertz, 3 phase AC. Immediately downstream of the circuit breaker, a control transformer steps down the 208 volt line to line voltage to our chosen level of pilot level voltage, 120 volts AC. The X2 side of the control transformer is ground referenced. Also, downstream of the main circuit breaker is a manual motor starter that makes or breaks connection to paired contactors wired such that the F contactor induces forward rotation and the R contactor induces reverse rotation of the three phase AC induction motor. The contactors are mechanically interlocked with one another such that they may not be simultaneously closed. Let's assume the F contactor is on the left and the R contactor is on the right. Additionally, a single overload relay serves to protect the motor from sustained overload conditions. Let's leave the motor unattached for now. Once these primary devices have been configured as illustrated, install the Tico SG2 PLR on the top DIN rail and then route the 120 volt AC control transformer high X1 and the ground and X2 output to the L and N power connections of the PLC. These connections power the internal functions of the device and are ordinarily not illustrated in the schematic. It should be stated that the Tico SG2 PLR must not contain an active program in memory before continuing with the installation. If an inadvertent program remains in memory upon power up, the device will immediately execute that program with potentially disastrous consequences. Take the time to ensure your device is cleared and stopped before you get yourself into trouble that you cannot get out of. Given this safe starting condition, our intention is to configure the Tico SG2 PLR in the following fashion. The PLC will make use of six field input devices. A normally open maintain contact selector switch on input 1. A normally closed momentary contact red push button on input 2. A normally open momentary contact green push button on input 3 a normally open momentary contact yellow push button on input 4, the normally open auxiliary F1 contact of the F contactor on input 5, and the normally open auxiliary R1 contact of the R contactor on input 6. The first four field input devices are intended for human-initiated interaction with our system, whereas the auxiliary contacts on inputs 5 and 6 serve as feedback about the status of a particular contactor. Note the maintain contact normally closed e-stop is not a direct input to the PLC, but rather serves as a hardwired bottleneck through which all six field input devices immediately downstream of it must negotiate to issue input to the PLC. Wired in this fashion, the hardwired e-stop effectively severs all incoming communication with the outside world without the necessity of resorting to any programmed instructions to do so. Note the schematic shows the field signals kind of disappearing down the rabbit hole of the appropriate PLC input. This is to imply isolation between the field input devices and the PLC exists, and that the PLC program assumes responsibility for all incoming transmissions from this point on. Wire numbers can be used to further clarify points of connection. Note wire 3 is not a single wire, but rather the pooled connection of all upstream terminals of field input devices intended to operate at 120 volts AC. Let's now examine the output configuration. Electromechanical relay output Q1 energizes or de-energizes the F contactor coil hardwired with the normally closed overload contact. Electromechanical relay output Q2 energizes or de-energizes the R contactor coil also hardwired with the same normally closed overload contact. 
This hardwired connection between the F and R contactor coils and the normally closed overload allows the overload to have the last say as to whether the motor is energized or not and never surrenders complete authority to the PLC. Wired in this fashion, the normally closed overload contact serves as a means of overriding the program in the event of an overload. Electromechanical relay output Q3 energizes or de-energizes a red pilot lamp and electromechanical relay output Q4 energizes or de-energizes a green pilot lamp. Again, note the maintained contact normally closed e-stop serves as a hardwired bottleneck through which all field output devices immediately downstream of it must also negotiate to be energized. Wired in this fashion, the hardwired e-stop directly above stream of all field output devices effectively severs all outgoing communication from the PLC without the necessity of resorting to any programmed instructions to do so. Note the schematic kind of leaves unsaid what actually opens or closes the Q1 through 4 contacts. This is again meant to imply that isolation exists between the PLC and the output, and the program is in charge of actually opening and closing these contacts. All a technician needs to do is wire the devices as indicated. Wire numbers can again be used to further clarify points of connection. Note Wire 3's pooled connection has expanded to include all the upstream terminals of the electric mechanical relay outputs Q1 through Q4, and that Wire 2 is the pooled connection of all field output device return paths. Additionally, you note that the F and R contactor coils are mechanically interlocked together, preventing their simultaneous closure, and both contactor coils are serviced by the same normally closed overload contact. Let's wire this system up. If we do this correctly the first time, always a dicey proposition given the involvement of your lazy lab partner, we theoretically should never have to do this again and can quickly program and reprogram the PLC as we see fit to perform numerous different functions. First, install the e-stop and three pilot lamps, red, green, and yellow in the top push button enclosure. Note the yellow pilot lamp is a place filler and won't be used for this system. Its sole purpose is to prevent your lazy lab partner from sticking their finger in an empty hole. The four field input devices go in the bottom push button enclosure, as indicated in the schematic. Top to bottom, they are the normally open maintained contact selector switch, the normally closed momentary contact red push button, the normally open momentary contact green push button, and finally, the normally open momentary contact yellow push button. All right. Let's begin by routing wire 1 from the control transformer output to the normally closed e-stop. Wire 3 then goes from the e-stop to the first four field input devices in the bottom push button enclosure. Note the daisy chain connection pools all these devices together. Wire 3 also pools the 1, 3 terminals of the F1 and R1 auxiliary contacts. Now, respectively route wires 4, 5, 6, and 7 from the first four field input devices to inputs I1, I2, I3, and I4 on the PLC. Similarly, respectively route wires 8 and 9 from the F1 and R1 auxiliary contacts to inputs I5 and I6 on the PLC. Theoretically, one can now button up the bottom push button enclosure containing the first four field input devices and never have to open it again. Let's now move on to the output. An additional wire 3 comes out of the e-stop and then is daisy chained to all electromechanical relay outputs. Outputs Q1 and Q2 are respectively routed to the F and R contactor coil A1 terminals using wires 10 and 12. Outputs Q3 and Q4 are respectively routed to the red and green pilot lamp X1 terminals using wires 13 and 14. Given the reversing wire kit has conveniently already conjoined the A2 terminals of both the F and R contactor coils, wire 11 comes out of the conjoined A2 terminals and goes right into the conveniently available 9-5 terminal of the normally closed overload. Wire 2 comes out of the 9-6 terminal of the normally closed overload and is landed on the grounded control transformer X2 terminal. Similarly, the X2 terminals of the red and green pilot lamps are conjoined together and the wire 2 return path is landed on the grounded control transformer X2 terminal. Theoretically, one can now button up the top push button enclosure containing the e-stop and the pilot lamps and never have to open it again. We've completed the installation of this system. Given the Tico SG2 PLR is a flexible, reprogrammable device, we should be able to examine several different programs without ever having to undergo the time-consuming necessity of rewiring it ever again. Not all inputs nor all outputs will be used for all future exercises. 
However, the system has enough ins and outs that we will probably never grow tired of poking it with a sharp stick and seeing it jump. Our next task is to test the inputs and outputs and make sure everything functions as intended. Closing the circuit breaker and opening the manual motor starter after plugging the system in ensures the primary device is below strain with the motor starter or deep power during the test procedure, yet the control transformer and pilot portion above strain with the manual motor starter remain active. Additionally, ensure that the e-stop is in the deactivated closed condition. A recommended test program is as follows. Rung 1 contains a make instruction examining input I1, the normally open maintain contact selector switch, selectively energizing or de-energizing output Q1, the F contactor coil. Rung 2 contains a make instruction examining input I2, the normally closed momentary contact red push button, selectively energizing or de-energizing output Q3, the red pilot lamp. I must reiterate, this rung's purpose is to selectively energize or de-energize output Q3, the red pilot lamp, and not Q2, the R contactor. We'll use this output in a later rung. Rung 3 contains a make instruction examining input I3, the normally open momentary contact green push button, selectively energizing or de-energizing output Q2, the R contact or coil. I must reiterate, this rung's purpose is to selectively energize or de-energize output Q2, the R contact or coil, and not Q3, the red pilot lamp. Rung 2 already has that particular output covered. Finally, rung 4 contains a make instruction examining input I4 the normally open momentary contact yellow push button, selectively energizing or de-energizing output Q4, the green pilot lamp. Note the field input device attached to input I2 is normally closed, whereas all others are normally open. Additionally, note the outputs go top to bottom, Q1, F contactor coil, Q3, red pilot lamp, Q2, R contactor coil, and finally, Q4, green pilot lamp. When the program is downloaded to the target device and placed into operation, Note in the deactivated state, the make instruction examining input I2, the normally closed momentary contact red push button, energizes output Q3 when the red pilot lamp turns on. When only the normally open maintain contact selector switch on input I1 is actuated into the closed position, output Q1 is energized and the F contactor closes. Additionally, output Q3 remains energized and the red pilot lamp remains on. You note the F contact carrier moves and the status screen should indicate that input I5 is asserted, meaning that the F contactor is closed. When only the normally closed momentary contact red push button on input 2 is actuated into the open position, output Q3 is de-energized and the red pilot lamp turns off. When only the normally open momentary contact green push button on input 3 is actuated into the closed position, output Q2 is energized and the R contactor closes. Additionally, output Q3 remains energized and the red pilot lamp remains on. You note the R contact carrier moves and the status screen should indicate input I6 is asserted. This verifies that the R contactor is closed. Finally, when only the normally open momentary contact yellow push button and input 4 is actuated into the closed position, output Q4 is energized and the green pilot lamp turns on. Additionally, output Q3 remains energized and the red pilot lamp remains on. Everything seems to be functioning as anticipated for normal operation. Let's now test the functionality of the e-stop. When the e-stop is actuated into the open position, the PLC should remain powered up and the status screen should indicate no input or output is energized regardless of how vigorously or frequently they're poked, prodded, diddled, or dorked with. That's the point. The e-stop has severed all incoming and outgoing communication to and from the PLC without the necessity of relying on a programmed instruction to do so. The hardwired connection between the e-stop and all field input and output devices serves to override whatever the PLC may be directing at the time. Let's reset the e-stop and test the functionality of the hardwired overload contact. When input I1 is closed, output Q1 is energized and the F contactor closes as previously. Input I5, the F1 auxiliary contact, is asserted, verifying that the F contactor is closed as directed. When the overload relay is manually actuated into the open position, the F contactor coil is directly de-energized without involvement of the PLC. Output Q1 may remain energized, but without the approval of the overload contact, there is no way the F contactor coil will be energized. Input I5, the F1 auxiliary contact, is also de-energized, indicating that the F contactor is open because of some outside disturbance. 
When the overload relays mainly reset to the closed position, the F contactor closes, and in input I5, the F1 auxiliary contact is asserted, verifying the F contactor is reclosed. The hardwired overload contact appears to function as intended for the F contactor. Let's now test the functionality of the overload contact with respect to the R contactor. In a repeat of the previous test, when input I3 is closed, output Q2 is energized, and the R contactor closes. Input I6, the R1 auxiliary contact, is asserted, verifying that the R contactor is closed as directed. When the overload relay is manually actuated into the open position, the R contactor coil is directly de-energized without involvement of the PLC. Output Q2 may remain energized, but without the approval of the overload contact, there is no way the R contactor coil will be energized. Input I6, the R1 auxiliary contact, is also de-energized, indicating the R contactor is open because of some outside disturbance. When the overload relay is manually reset to the closed position, the R contactor closes in input I6, the R1 auxiliary contact is again asserted, verifying that the R contactor is reclosed. The hardwired overload contact appears to function as intended for the R contactor. All right, I believe we accomplished what we intended to do. In conclusion, we installed a basic PLC, the Tico SG2 10HRA PLR on the motor control trainer board and configured it to receive input from four operator actuated switches and two auxiliary contacts for feedback purposes. Additionally, we configured it to direct the output of two mechanically interlocked contactor coils and two pilot lamps. We wired up the system as indicated and tested the functionality of all inputs and outputs. Next, we tested the hardwired override function of the e-stop for all input and output devices. And finally, we tested the hardwired override function of the overload for both the F and R contactor coils. Given this base configuration can be quickly programmed and reprogrammed as we see fit, without the time-consuming necessity of physically rewiring it, we should be able to cut through the next crowd of labs faster than Anakin Skywalker at a Jedi preschool. Stay tuned for PLC-based two-wire, three-wire, jogging, reversing motor starter applications, and more in the very near future. Until then, remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.